When I skate for the first time, I've seen London in a totally new light. I was born with a disability called limb pelvic hypoplasia, which means I have no arms and short legs. I have a weak pelvis, so I'm unable to walk. Usually I'm in my electric wheelchair on the pavement and I don't really get a chance to really sightsee and look around because I'm usually get, trying to get from A to B. But when you're on the road and with loads of people and you can see everything all around, it's a whole new experience to London. It's like I've never experienced London like that before and I just love it now. The Wheels and Wheelchairs started all the way back in 2012. Um, because a French group had been doing it for 20 years prior to that and for the 20th anniversary they wanted to challenge themselves to escape from Paris all the way to um, London for the start of the Paralympic Games and then they ended up coming over and loads of skaters saw what they were doing I was like we need to start something here so that's how Wheels and Wheelchairs was born I first knew about it at the end of 2018, where I went to Winter Wonderland uh, on the ice rink and one of the ice marshals came up to me and said, would you be interested in wheelchair roller skating? And I said, yeah, I've never done anything like that before. We go out, we skate, we have fun. People who are wheelchair users come out with us, they get the, the buzz out of whizzing along at speed and it's, they find it good fun as well. So we're having fun, they're having fun. We've had wheelchair users whose parents come out with them who also skate and multiple times they say this is the first time that I've had been able to do a joint activity with my son or daughter. It's just, it's just nice that family can come together and do stuff together. I think I found it on Facebook and I was looking for something where I could skate because I enjoy skating but so where she could join me as well. So it was amazing to find it actually because I didn't know there was adapted wheelchairs either. Every Sunday, 400 to 500 skaters would go around London, every Sunday. And I didn't know that even existed, so I just thought, wow, this is really cool. I think I managed one lap <laughs> on some skates that I'd had for about 20 years. So I've updated to inlines and now I'm much better, yeah. <laughs> You're laughing at me. <laughs> We're just slowly building a community. Yeah, there's a lot of um, ideas in the pipeline. My name is Isaac Harvey. I'm the president of Wheels and Wheelchairs, and that's where we do wheelchair roller skating. I like it. Short and sweet. Get to the point. This is fantastic. Isaac, it is a absolute pleasure to meet you. Yes, you too. So I always say, before we get to know a business or an organization, we need to understand who the person that we are talking to. So Isaac, where are you? And tell us, tell, I mean, from, from childhood to like higher education. Uh, okay, so I was I'm in East London and I was born with a disability called limb pelvic hypoplasia, which means I have no arms um, and short legs. I have a weak pelvis, so I'm not able to walk. And I have scoliosis, which is the curvature of the spine, um, but that's been corrected by metal work. Um, and when it's come to education, my family, well, my mum especially made sure I went to a mainstream school and not a special school but the school I went to had assistants um, which would help me uh, during class um, take the pens and um, books out of my bag put my hand up when I had to answer a question and yeah that I did that until I was about 18 um, did I don't know what the equivalent is in in America but we did I did my a levels that was my last um, part, a and then... Uh, A-level is at... What, what's, what's the age at for A-levels? Uh, it's just before university. Okay, so, like, I mean, obviously it's, it's, a, like a, it's high school, but it's, like, when you're 18, so, like, I mean, I don't know, because we, we would go from 
18, you end high school, and then you go to university and college. Oh, right, okay. Because uni, uni and college, you consider the same thing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, we have it separate. Okay. So we, we have high school, college, or another thing called sixth form, and then uh, university. Okay. So I did the uh, sixth form, so yeah. Sixth form okay, slash so college. Before we get into college, um, let's go yeah, all yeah. the way back. So Okay, um, let's go back, yeah. So... Can you tell me what you you were born with? What again? Because it was long and you said it fast. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> yes, uh, limb pelvic hypoplasia. Okay, you, you say it so easily, and it's like I mean, when you were so. You're born, and do you have siblings? Yes. Um, how many siblings? So I have four brothers and three sisters. Okay, big family. Um, where where are you on the numbers of the children? I'm the youngest. You're the youngest. So um, you 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 are born. Um, you have, and I'm I'm gonna really mess it up, so I'm not even gonna say it. So like I'm just gonna like let you continue to say the word. Um, but how was it living in East London? Um, and and I'm I like bravo to your mother. Bravo to your mother for not letting you go to a special school because I think that's the biggest thing because the world is not special. And so you need to be able to like see how the world is as it is. And so mm. bravo, bravo, bravo to your mom for making sure that you saw the world as it is and not through a a, a, um, a bubble or a, a different lens. So how was it growing up in your household and how did your siblings treat you as you were growing up? Okay, so I'm gonna mix up a bit even more here. <laughs> so, uh, um, so I was fostered at two weeks, um, and then adopted by the same family at five. So uh, then, um, well, family's family, but they're not my birth family. Um, but they just treated me like everyone else, um, and because of that, there's like a thirty year gap between me and my youngest sister. So they oh, by the time I had well growing up they had already moved out. So it was just me and one brother at home. Um he helps out with mum. Um but yeah, so I I have grown up with them but not in like the same household. Um but they've all been supportive and really treated me like no one different really, which has uh, helped. In the world that we live in right now, um, mm. you have individuals that have disabilities. Can I say disabilities? Because I, I never know what can I what I can and cannot say. So I always ask, I'm like, like, what would you prefer to be used in regards of con conversation? Uh, well, people with disabilities is fine okay. with me. Okay. Um, so in the world that we live in with uh, individuals that, are, um, that have disabilities, there are individuals that automatically, I have a disability, they use it as a handicap, literally as a handicap where I can't do anything. Um, when I heard about you, I was blown away. I was I was blown away because when I was younger in high school, I volunteered at the Special Olympics. I whenever the Special Olympics comes on, I am I like the Olympics is great. I love the it's great, but the yeah. Special Olympics is like it's badass. It's like I get so excited <laughs> because whenever I'm having a bad day and I'm like, nope, you have no right to have a bad day because. If there's an individual that literally was like, let's just say went, they went to war and they got their leg um, blown off and now they're winning Olympics, Olympic medals, I have no right to have a pity party. I go, I can't have a pity party, but I I have no time to wallow in it because there are people that are doing great things. So when you see individuals, because um, you are such an inspiration, when you see individuals from the time that you were younger all the way through, um, just basically wallowing in their circumstances. How do you react to that, and what do you do for them, or how does it alter how you think about your life? Um, it's a bit of a so I tell you, as, um, growing up, so because I've had the really support of the family around me, they've always um helped me over see that I can overcome anything with my disability. So I've I've always found it easy to overcome challenges and um, obstacles that life puts in my way. But the one thing I did struggle with, and this is what everyone struggles with, is the mental health side of things. 
So I was, as you said, I'm, I've been seen as an inspiration and I can do these. I've done skiing, I've done skydiving, I've done so many of these different things. But when it came to my mental health and being seen as these things, I thought I couldn't be honest with um, my audience because I... I, I was I was known as this inspiration. How could I be upset? How could I be uh, unhappy this day? So it was kind of like this vicious circle of putting up a face um, to say I'm always happy when sometimes I wasn't. So uh, it was very hard on me. And it got to a point where I, I just didn't feel, I, well, I didn't feel comfortable speaking with anyone because I thought it was something I had to deal with, uh, especially knowing that I could overcome a lot of things in life. Um, that one day it just got to a breaking point where I was like, okay, I really need to take a step back and really evaluate things. Um, and that's when I don't know if you've seen. There's a movie called Lucy. Um, so it's a film. Uh, basically, the premise of it is it's using more than ten percent of your brain. Uh, allows you to uh, achieve things or something like that. So, um, so I. I thought, well, can you use more than 10% of your brain? I don't know why it's, it's so funny how I just thought of that when I was at the breaking point. Because I'd only watched the film like three years before that or something. Yeah, three, four years before that. And then after doing some research on YouTube, I discovered uh, the law of attraction and how we think, feel, and speak is the reality that we create. Um, and that kind of put everything in perspective. Um and after that, I've been very conscious of how I think through and speak. And I feel a lot more happier over that. And because now I've got my mind together alongside my disability, I feel I can conquer a lot of things. Um, and I and speaking to other people who, well, I think it's just being honest and saying, look, it's a human, it's human nature to feel down. But um Things can turn around if you just change your perspective and uh, just educating people. Because I, I feel, you know, some of these inspirational speakers, they are a bit too positive and I just don't think that's a real look on life. You've got to be I, I, real. I, I have to interrupt you for a second because I have to say thank you for saying that because um, I always, so I, like, I when I'm doing speeches, when I'm talking to people, when I'm mentoring people, when I'm like with my clients, I, I'm filter free. I'm like, I keep it real. And I always tell them, I'm like, you can't pretend to be like everyone else. I mean, you are your own individual person and your circumstances will change and you have to react in the most real way to the circumstances. And so when you listen to an inspirational speaker, yeah, they make you feel great right now, but you have to remember, you still have to take, like, what are you going to take from those speeches? Um, and then how are you going to inject it to your life, wherever you are in your life? So I'm so happy that you said that, that Listening to an inspirational speaker is great, but sometimes it's just not, it does, it's not conducive, conducive to what your life is right now. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, yeah, using what they've said and, as you said, pointing to your own life and your own life uh, circumstances. Where, I was like, it, what university did you go to and what was your major? Uh, so, after school, I um I got a bit fed up of school. I was like, I need to get, I need to get out of education, because um I've got a creative mind and I I got to keep my mind active. If I'm in the same place all the time, I get very I don't feel it's really challenging me, and I get really bored. So at the time, I was really into video games, and I wanted to become a video game tester. So I did open university, which is where you do it at home and you send stuff in. But I did that for about a couple of months and I thought, nah, this is not for me really. So wait, so, so wait, so you're testing it. So they, they send you the games and you're testing them to see if the game is like, you know, worth like, you know, marketing or so you're part of the marketing team on the back end? Uh, no, so it's more of testing the game and seeing if there's any bugs and glitches. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of like keep playing the same level over and over again until it's uh, fixed. That would seem boring to me to keep playing the level over yeah, and over. Exactly. Well, 
Well, especially because if you beat the level fast, I mean, then you just have to redo it and redo it and redo it. Yeah, that's, yeah, that would be painful. Yeah, and it, to be honest, it put me off so much that I don't play games anymore. Oh, you're muted. Oops, that's it. I was going to say, that's in, what? I'm putting it on mute when you're talking because I wanted to then how because like I have fans. All right, so full disclosure, it is really hot here. I don't know, is it hot in London? Uh not at the moment, but two weeks ago it was. Yeah, it's it is ridiculous here. So of mm. course I have fans going in everywhere. And so when I'm doing the podcast, everyone's like, Well, why don't you put the AC on? Which of course is the funny part. I have AC, but yeah. I don't like AC. So I right. don't have it on, which is stupid. <laughs> and I, so I have fans that are on and the fans are loud. And so they're on. And so while you're talking, I just want to have it on mute so that way you're clear. It's, I'm ridiculous. I'm just, I'm ridiculous. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> the environment, it's hot. Mother nature, it's, ah, oh, here, this is where we are. Okay. So. Yes. So the video games were a bus for you. So that was just not where you wanted to go. So what happened next? Um. So nothing. So for my a level uh or sixth form i did uh media um and i before work well, growing up and when youtube was starting to become a thing i thought oh i want to create my own videos so i did gameplay videos where i play games and then I upload that and put things together and then i, I really enjoyed that then i I don't know if you're the Windows Movie Maker, really basic editing software. Um, I use that to create videos. And then for my A-levels, I did media and they gave me a really good uh, video editing software that I could use at home because at, in school, because I had the learning support assistants, some of them weren't great on the computer. So teaching them how to edit on a computer when they didn't have much good computer skills was going to be impossible for me to do my lessons. So they gave me uh, some software that I could use at home where I could uh, use my feet at home on the computer. But the other problem was it was software that they hadn't used before because they had Macs and I had a Windows computer. So they had to get the equivalent, which then I had to learn, self-learn on uh, YouTube on how to use this software. Um, but it was, it was good because I've self-taught myself those software and uh, now I continue to edit videos. And then I, I, I created, I started creating vlogs on YouTube, which I really enjoyed. That's amazing. Uh, yes. Well, the, 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 I think that the, the funny part about it is that whole entire, here's a program, we have no idea how it works, figure it out. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you did because because some people would have walked away and said i go um i don't know how to do this and if you're not going to teach me i don't want to do it at all you went yeah. home and you're like i'll figure this out yeah yeah no i had to otherwise yeah i don't know how else it would i would have done the lessons otherwise where did that um the zest the zest to like figure out things come from you because again um you could have been in any situation where if someone's not going to do it for me, I'm not going to do it. So where did that, I, I don't even know what word I want to use, but where did, where did it stem from? Like, I mean, all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to, it's like self-taught or figuring out things and just doing things. Where did, where did that come from? I mean, was it a teacher? Was it your mom? Was it a sibling? I think it's a mixture of things really, but I, I think overall it's the idea of overcoming things with my disability um and mom always not really telling me no i can't do this uh and always saying yeah you, you can do that so he's seeing make me the best version i am basically um but i guess it's also the people i've come across along the way too so yeah this is again why i said you inspire me and you make me so happy <laughs> and no no honestly i go when I mean, and I just saw a little something about you. So um, we're, and we're going to get to why, like why we're talking, but sure. what do you do for the career? I mean, what is that career? Cause like you're, I hear, I hear technology, I hear video, but what do you do for a career? 
Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> I, uh, I do so many different things, but um, I think the main ones are the, vi the video editing and uh, disability advocacy. I do a lot of uh, those two things. So how did you become the president of the cycling group? Because um, you, in the individual that was like full on indoors editing, I go, I'm like, I mean, like, like you're a technology person. Most technology individuals are like, they're introverts, they're indoors. Everything about you is like, I'm here extrovert and now I see outdoor. So how did that even happen? Okay, so uh, I'll go from the beginning. So the organized, so Wheels and Wheelchairs started in 2012 after a French group in Paris had been doing it 10 years before that. And that for the 10th anniversary, they challenged themselves to skate from Paris to London in start of the 2012 Games, the Paralympic Games. So they skated here once they had arrived um after some english skaters had helped them they came and loads many of the london skaters were like wow we need to start something here so three or four of them got together and basically came up with wheels and wheelchairs skip to 2018 um here in london there's a big huge park called hyde park and every uh, winter they have a Christmas market it's called uh, Winter Wonderland and I went there with a friend um, where I was in my electric wheelchair and we um, went on the ice rink I went on the ice rink in the chair um, just because we wanted to do that and then one of the ice marshals came up to me and we just started talking and then he said, oh, um, would you be interested in wheelchair roller skating? And I thought, oh, I've, I've never heard anything like that before. Because previously to that, you know, I've done skiing, I've done the skydive, I've done a few other adventurous, I think, adventurous things, but I didn't know about roller skating at all, actually. So I was like, okay, yeah, that sounds good. So he gave me his contact details, and I emailed them to say of my interest, uh, saying yeah, I'd would, I would love to do that, and then in it was twenty nineteen. Now this was January. I got an email back from the president of the organization, who was saying, "Oh yes, we we you really enjoy it. Um, we're looking forward to having you, and a very open and uh welcoming presence from the email." I was like, "Oh okay, this is nice." Um, and I saw some videos of it and I kind of understood what was happening. So I emailed back and said, oh, yes, I, I'd like to meet because they wanted to meet me beforehand. Before I, I did the skate just to go through it with me. So I yeah, I emailed back and then I, I didn't hear anything back for uh, a month or so. And I thought oh, I must have said something wrong here. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear anything back. Um but eventually I I got an email from the guy I met at the ice rink saying that we're really sorry we didn't get back to you, but sadly the president had passed away. Like it was a unforeseen, uh, they didn't expect it to happen. She just um, passed. Um, and I realized that was the same weekend that I'd emailed her back. So um, they had like had to have a month to really uh, reevaluate things and obviously um it was just a shock to everybody so um eventually I, I did me up with two of them uh told me all about it they said oh I might get motion sickness and uh you might not like it but most people do so I ended up going uh another park there's Battersea Park um Saturday morning um and went in the chair, skated around, and I absolutely loved it that I ended up going again a week later on the Sunday where we skated around London uh, for Easter and everyone was up wearing Easter costumes. So we're skating around London with like three, four hundred of us skating around London in Easter costumes. 
And I thought, oh, I love this. And I got really involved with most weeks. Um, went to Paris, did it with the French group, um, took part in the Paris Marathon and did so many activities. And then at the end of 2019, they have the AGM because they have a committee. And during the meeting, we went, we did an overview of the year and then they were looking for a new president and because of of my being so active and creating videos for the group they all turned their heads and asked me if I'd like to take that role um and I said you know it's such a I see a lot of potential in the group um but I knew there's going to be a lot of shoes to fill from the previous president but I ended up um, accepting and then I became the president and then the pandemic happened. So, <laughs> well, all right, we're gonna get we're gonna get to the pandemic. Yeah. We're gonna get to, yeah. So we're gonna like go back here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. So, one skydiving. Um, what are the other things that you've done? Like, like name all the adventurous things that you've done. Skydiving, we yeah. love. I've done some skydiving. Love it. Okay. Love it. Love I, it. I did it in America. Okay. Oh, where? I went to Ohio. Nice. Okay, so I did it in New Hampshire. Oh right. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry, Connecticut. I'm doing Connecticut. Um, so, skydiving one. What is the other things that you've done? Uh, skiing. Okay. So I've done that in Switzerland and Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, tall ship sailing. Nice. So that's a ship built for people with disabilities. It's like a proper pirate ship. Mm-hmm. Um, done that three times. Um, I've done abseiling in the wheelchair. What sailing? Uh, ab sailing what's that so it's when you go basically go backwards down a either steep hill or a um mountain cliff oh i'm gonna look yeah. that up and like in this it, look i'm gonna look it up and put a photo so that way so that, so that way we know what it is okay good okay, okay sure sure <laughs> okay. so again i'm i'm intrigued because I mean, before we go into you with the, the, you being in the organization i'm intrigued because you have no fear. Like <laughs> where you have no you have no fear. You challenge yourself and you're like constantly learning. The people around you, I'm gonna say, are awesome. Mm. Um, not only the people around you, but I mean just you wanting to do so many things. Because I mean, the average Joe, I mean, I'm that person where I hear something like I go, Australia, huh? I wonder how that would be. How would it be to watch a concert in the uh, Sydney Opera House? And I will figure out a way to get to Australia and go, which I have. And just, that's how I work. So you and yeah. I are definitely the same. Where you see something, you're like, "Let's do it. Let's do it." Yeah. yeah. Um, did your family ever get concerned? Did your friends ever get concerned when you were pushing the envelope and doing all these different activities? Uh, no, not really. I mean. My my yeah, everyone's just been very supportive, really. If because the way I see it is, if it can be done, why not? Did they ever come with you? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Some people come to see what what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. He he says he's going to do it. Isaac says he's going to do something. Got to go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, okay. it was like this. It was like the skiing. When I said I was going skiing, um, so my sister always wanted to do skiing with uh-huh. me, but obviously we didn't know how it would be done. Um, so after I'd done the sailing, they had teamed up with a uh, another company doing the skiing, mm-hmm. and basically, I got an email. I sent it to my sister. She said yes, absolutely. And uh, I booked it that same day. So <laughs> just like that. Not changing our minds. We're getting it done. That's, yeah, that's exactly. so cool. Oh, yeah. well, well, it's good though, because I'm telling you, once you put them in, once you put it in a person's mind, if you take time, they're going to back out. So if you book it, the commitment's there. They feel bad that you've already spent the money. So you're, they're in. Yep. That's it. Good strategy. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So the role, I mean, you had never been roller skating before. No, no. Okay. Um, what makes this group so special and what makes it so engaging for you? And also to be the president of this organization, what do you want out of it? I mean, what do you want to get out of 
being the president, like I go, what's the, I mean, do you want the visibility? Do you want it to grow? I'm like, what do you want to do? Because like, as you mentioned, you have a lot of shoes to fill with this woman that passed away. Um, One thing I really do love about this group, I mean, the first day I skated, it just felt as if I'd known everyone for years um, because everyone was so, well, they just treat you like everyone else. And the way I see it, and I always say this, is that we've got wheels under all of us. If a surface isn't good, we all have to suffer. If it's great, then we can all go faster, you know, and it's something that's kind of like a level playing field, being able to participate in this event. Um and when I see the future of it, I I would love to see it done worldwide one day because, you know, it took me six years to know about it. And it's like how many more people don't know about this and how much they would love it. Um, because I, I feel I benefit a lot from it. Uh, I've made a lot of good friends from it. Um, and even from the other end of seeing the skaters, they really love to push like all of voluntary skaters who push really do get out of it and um because no one gets paid for it and everyone just does it because it's fun and we all get to do it together is is it more the people or the sport that keeps people together um i definitely think it's the people it's it's definitely people when it comes to uh, skating what as as a president um what is your goal for this organization um you knew what it was before you, you mentioned it took six years for you to get to it and so now what is where do you want it to go from here i mean other than the fact that you want it to go global what what is it that you want the people to get out of it um how do you want society outside of the individuals that are part of it to know about it um yeah, what are your I mean, what are your goals? I mean, every president comes into a company with set goals that they want to do. What are your goals? Uh just continue continue to spread the word. Um, show people that this is something that because actually when you think about it, this is one of those sports which joins both able-bodied people and people with disabilities. Um uh, because for me, I I can't physically move the chi um the wheels and some people and most of our participants can't do that but there is a French within the French group there's a woman who you know how they do the um wheelchair races yes and they can move the wheels yes um there's one set of people who one skates and she does the wheels so they can go faster so I'm thinking in the future maybe this could be the first joint Paralympic and Olympic sport, which would be cool and make it like a competitive thing. I think that's that would be amazing because as I mean, I, I just watched the what was it, the world, the world sports, which I don't I, I don't recall ever remembering the world sports, but the world sports are the ones where brand new sports come into like they should test it out to see if they're going to add it to the Olympics. And I think that this is one of those moments where testing something out, making sure it works, making sure you build a community and then approaching it where um, the world sports or Olympics are aware of it. Because until they're, until there's a large group saying, hey, did you know that this sport exists? They don't know. And they, they have no idea where to go from there. Yes, um, yeah. And it's just spreading the word. 20, I mean, look at it, yeah. So March, actually in UK, February. February 2020. <laughs> yeah. February 2020. Um, so between February 2020 and we are in August 2021. 2022. Oh my god, this is where I am. 2022. <laughs> yeah. Where are we? Yeah. Um, we've had a long run with the pandemic, still in the pandemic. We have discussions of recession. We have mm. um the Mother Nature clearly upset with everyone. Like Mother Nature <laughs> is clearly upset. Um, yes. We have monkeypox, where now monkeypox is an emergency in um, all kind of, uh, uh, the universe, in the universe, the, the world. Um, right. So, 
where were you at the beginning of all this craziness and how did you handle the pandemic, the, the, the close down, but also you guys have been getting record heat. So how's everything you've been going? How have you handled it? And you are, like, you are creating, you are running this organization. Ta talk to me about this big chunk of the past two years for you. Okay. So at the beginning, I was actually in Colorado um, for the skiing um and wait so when you're in colorado wait was was anyone even talking about pandemic when you were in colorado or you're just happy go lucky skiing um so basically this was when it was starting to become a thing but it wasn't as big it was it was that one week where everyone started to just have the shutdowns uh over just a couple of days but I was in Colorado, done the skiing for the first three days. Um, and then the news was picking up on it. And you probably know this from watching American news. I think they really over-dramatized things. Like, it, it was like watching a movie. Just a, just a little bit. <laughs> it, honestly, it was like watching a movie. Like <laughs> dramatic music. And I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? <laughs> Like it's, it's never like this in the UK, honestly. <laughs> and the, seeing the faces on some people, like there was fear from those people's faces. Um, like for me, I, I wasn't really scared or worried because you know the way I saw it was I had my bank card, I had my laptop, um, and I had my passport. So whatever happens, happens. You know, <laughs> I'm 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 ready for it. Um. So it got to, so it was Thursday, and then I went skiing. Sadly, I had a ski accident at the top. Uh, the skis got tangled with the person helping me, and I hit my head at the top of the mountain. Did you get a concussion? <laughs> a small concussion, yeah. Okay, so wait, so you're in Colorado, we're in a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. At the beginning, a little bit dramatic, but it became serious, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so were you in a hospital? Did you have to stay in Colorado? How did you get home? Well, so I was up the mountain. The woman who was uh, helping was so apologetic. I was like, oh, gosh, what do we do? Do you want to, should we wait for mountain rescue? I was like, no. Luck, I was still conscious, but um, I was like, no, let's just go down, like, we could be up here forever if it takes the mountain rescue to get to us. We'll just ski down. Got down, was checked up by the doctors there. Um, and I was more concerned because of my metal work in my back. So they scanned me out and they, basically the guy, the doctor said, I have a small concussion. Um, you have to wear this neck brace so you don't get pain in your neck and you can't ski anymore. So I was like, okay, well, that's my holiday over then. And I was like really Wait, excited can't, about that. Can't ski today, this this trip or ever. No, this trip. Okay, good. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, this trip because he was like, if you know, if if you were to have an accident again, it could get really worse. So I was like, okay. Um, and where we were in Winter Park, we couldn't go anywhere. Like we couldn't go into the uh the main city because they only have one train in the morning and one train in the evening. And it was like, we can't go anywhere. So I was like, oh, I'm really gutted. I can't do anything. But literally, uh, two days later, they had shut the slopes down because they were like, yeah, we can't mi do mixing anymore. Um, it got really serious. So we didn't do anything for like two days because of that. And then flights were getting cancelled. So we... <laughs> So my group were panicking and getting really like, oh, how are we going to get home? Here's me just easy breezy, like, okay, well, you know, we're here now. We've got to do what we got to do. But we ended up getting a free flight where we had to go to Texas and then go to the UK, um, which was quite smooth. And then came home a week later, it was locked down in the UK. Um, and I was in the mouth of like, yeah, just a week. Um, and then yeah, loads of activities that I was gonna do got cancelled, and um, I had been facilitating workshops for people with disabilities and mental health conditions. That stopped to find out what we could do going forward with that. 
Um, so it was the first two months was everyone trying to figure out what was going on and how we can go forward with it. Because, you know, back then we didn't know how long it was going to be. But for me, I used it to my biggest advantage because usually I'm out and about doing this, that and the other. Uh, this was the first time that I got to slow down. And and use it to to learn things and relax actually and not have to worry about traveling all the time. So I thought it was great actually the first two months. <laughs> I, you know what I um I'm with you. I mean I I'm first generation born in America. Um, Haitian parents don't let their kids out. Like we're not allowed to go out anyway. School right. home, school home, school home. So when the pandemic happened, like I was designed for this. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm good. So people would call. They're like, "How are you doing?" I go, "I have activities. I have plenty of things to keep me busy." And they're like, "Really?" I go, "Yeah, I, yeah, it it is." Um, but I, you, your traveling all over made this so seamless. Where the people around you, I mean, like I'm sure they were panicking because I I was in Mexico when it started, and I got home 48 hours before Massachusetts closed down. So right. I totally understand, and I wasn't panicking because I loved being where I was, but. Being away from, I mean, I know people that weren't able to get home for a year. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And so for me, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that would have been problematic for me. So I'm happy that you guys got home safely and with no problem. But the concussion, you're traveling. So now you're dealing with, with a concussion. Um, <laughs> yeah. from a, It's supposed to be a beautiful little holiday, but now you're dealing with concussion. And then you're on top of the concussion. You're trying to figure out how to get home. Yeah. I mean, that didn't cause any stress for you at all? Well, not for me. Not really. I think the way I see it is, it's like we're in the situation now. I mean, what's gonna be is gonna be, but and we were. I I had the feeling we were gonna get home eventually. Uh, so, <laughs> so <laughs> sure, eventually we're gonna get home. <laughs> <laughs> you are funny. Whatever. I think that was a, I think that was a concussion talking. You're like, whatever. I'm feeling yeah, good. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love it. Like, obviously, yeah, there was a bit of concern. Like, yeah, we need to get home, but I don't know. The, Cause one of the people who lived out there was like, okay, if you if you can't get home, you can stay at my place. Um, I don't know how he was going to get like eight of us there, but yeah, he was willing to take us on. Um, and he was like, oh, we can go hunting. I was like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> sounds cool. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was just I was mentally preparing for that, really. Well, I was going to say, go, another activity. You've never done it, yeah. but sure. <laughs> yeah. Like, there you go. I love it. I mean, I, I really do love the whole entire, like you are, you don't even understand how you and I are, have the same personality where, I go, I, um, there's a, a book, one of my favorite books is Chandra Rhymes, The Year of Yes. And right. her sister challenged her because she would say no to everything. But yet, like, he's like, she's like, I go for a year, you have to say yes to things. And she, she said that I had the most amazing year because all these different opportunities, all these different things started keep coming up. And I, this is the way I've always lived where I'm like, I'm not shy to do things by myself or do things with people, travel around the world, whatever. I see something, I hear something, and I'm like, I'm going. So I love him. Mm. I'm, I'm like, well, as you're just talking, you're just dropping like, yeah, I went skiing. Yeah, my gosh. Yeah, my girl hunting. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You are ridiculously hysterical. I love it. <laughs> you are yeah. awesome. All right. So, so, but, so now you get home, but how was it for the year? I mean, like the, the, the two or three years. I mean, what was it like? Because again, you're president of an organization that is pretty much people and outdoors. Yes. I go in, uh, and in Europe, the numbers started getting higher and higher and higher, dramatically higher. And so what was it like for you trying to navigate? Like, I mean, because exercise is life. You know, yes. it really is life. I mean, the the being with the people is therapeutic. So you have the sports and the people. But now you can't, you don't have any of that. And you're leading the whole entire force. So how was it? How were you able to like navigate the couple of years? Because a lot of people... They need to be with others. They mm. need it. They can't survive with it. And thus the mental care, the depression comes in. So yes. how were you able to navigate all that for them on top of navigate, navigating it for you? I mean, it was pretty much impossible to do any sort of activity 
when it came to the skating because you know we weren't allowed to really go out um a certain radius of our uh where we were and we had to stay in bubbles and very restricted and i think the first time back skate well i didn't do the first skate back but uh it was must have been a month two well probably three months where there was no skating for a while and um then a group of them went to a, a park where they most of them lived nearby because this one some of the rules were stuck well they weren't fully relaxed but they started to get relaxed uh for a little period so everyone well a little group of them went and skated, which I was quite disappointed when I saw some of the pictures of them having fun. <laughs> um, because I lived I lived too far to get there. Um and then there was a rule um because there was different tiers of um things you could and couldn't do. Oh no, no, it was sorry, it wasn't that. It was um tier one was like really bad tier two you could do a little bit so yeah so are are the tiers uh in regards of locations or like you I mean like so different towns because we had we had it by color i go yes. so there was like a different color zone where you could tell like you know, the areas that were obviously in the red was like you mm. stayed away from those um and they had a certain amount of numbers of individuals that had covid and then the lower it is it could turn, turn green and then you were able to like come in and out and i live in a very small town and yeah. so um, we knew, I mean, like, because it's a small town, everyone pretty much knows everybody. We were all like, we were all in the bubble. And if someone left the bubble, we knew. We knew. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It, basically that. And um, it was like, if you're in red, you can't leave your location or if it's orange and green and all of that. Um, but there was a clause because for people with disabilities, they could still meet for out, out outdoor activities if it was like um structured and like um yeah it's basically people with disabilities could meet for outdoor activities so i again you probably become really relaxed but i wasn't really too worried about uh obviously i was careful but i wasn't too worried about catching or anything so I, because we found out this could be allowed, some Saturdays we still met. Um, so I traveled into London, um, which was so weird because no one was really traveling and the trains were empty, the stations were empty. I'd not, like never seen London like that before. Um, but yeah, I, I got on, went on two bus, public transport buses and trains and got into London, did the skating where we were a bit more relaxed on how far, long and far we could go um, and then came back again. So that was rare, but we did it for every so often. I think we met every like three weeks or something to do that. Um, and then when it came to after the second lockdown here in the UK, we decided to do more of our own skates that we would organize so these were like much longer uh skates which would start in one place and end somewhere else and then we'll come back again so we did a, quite a lot of those um we went from you probably don't know these places but there's a place called bath and we skated to bristol which was like 12 miles i just want you to know i do know where bath is because when i was younger right. I used to go to London all the time because I have a oh, friend. Nice. I have a very good friend that is a Liverpoolian, and so we would hang out in Liverpool, and and then we'd like hop into London. And I was young, and we drank a lot. And I, I the, <laughs> only proof, the only proof I have is lots of photos. So I know I've been there. I remember like key <laughs> functions of the trip. But in my youth, we partied a lot. So we, from Boston to London, it's like it's a five and a half hour flight. So yes, we would go like to save money doing our silly yeah. little kid, like young jobs. And then we'd go to like London or Scotland and party and then go back home. So just so you know, <laughs> I know where Bath is. Boom. Oh, oh right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just had to stop you right there. I love yeah, the country. Yeah, well, 
Yeah. Well, do you know what Bristol is? I do. Well, okay, well. The, you know, the, the, the weirdest thing, I've been in that entire area, Wales, and everyone's like, how come you've never been to Wales? It's right there. I go, I don't know. I have no idea. What, so whenever someone's like, oh, you've been to Wales, I go, no, I've never been to Wales. I'm like, how is that possible? I go, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I need to come back. I, mean, I haven't been, I mean, I it, like, literally, it was when I was young. I mean, I was like in my 20s when right. I went there. So like, I mean, it's like, like, it's been 30 years since I've been there. So I need to go, I need to go back. Yeah, no, you, well, I'm here. So yeah, we could meet and party. <laughs> oh. See, you just said a key word. We can meet and party. Boom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Back to business. Yeah. Back to business. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yes, yes. So, so so we're in so you're so you're you're home you're like you're not getting the groups together um what i mean how good is london in regards of the uk overall in regards of engaging with disability and what could they do better because or there's i mean there's like a t- whole entire group of individuals that they want activities they want to be they want to do fun things they want to engage with life they don't want to just be seen as i'm sitting home doing nothing I'm just like waiting for life to pass me by. So you're showing uh, the United Kingdom that we are active. We want to do more. We want to be engaging. We are part of this community. What can the UK, but also overall the world learn about? How do we sit there and make the world more engaging for individuals that are disabled? Um. So here in the UK, I mean, I it's... Since 2012 and the Olympics, they really did push to make things more accessible. And because the Paralympics were also here, making a bit more of that push to uh, make things more accessible and more accepting. And I feel if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be where we are now. Not saying that it's perfect now, because there are a lot of problems. Um and a lot of things that simple things get that can be fixed um but i think you know one thing that i do online is just tell well show people what can be done with a disability as a first but also taking the opportunity to educate people um constructively because you know if you don't know about something you don't know so you know how can we really get angry about something if someone genuinely just doesn't know about something because you know some people within well any community uh may get really offended if someone says something out of pocket obviously if it's offensive it's offensive but some people just genuinely don't know and they want to learn and and or if even if they don't want to learn they just don't know so i i feel as much as it's a responsibility for others, I feel I have a responsibility of teaching people about disability and what can be done. And uh, you shouldn't be scared to talk to us, <laughs> you know, we're like everyone else. Um, and I'm here to just teach people um, things. So I think how can the world be better engaged uh, by talking to us and not being so scared I love that you just said scared. Um, children are not scared of anything until yes. someone makes them afraid of. So they're curious because they're filling, I always say they're mm. filling their database. Um, I have no filter. So when I see something, I don't want to talk behind your back. I'm asking you, I'm engaging with you. I need to learn, learn from you. Um, fear is by far one of the biggest limits to the human, the human condition growing because they're curious, but they're fearful of something. And so mm. the fear drives the, I'm not going there. I go, and then a lot of prejudices come from there. Um, how do we stop that in the world of the disabled? Because again, a child will come up to you and like, I go, tell me how you don't have your arms. Yeah. Tell me how you're skiing. Tell me how you're, like they they want to know. And their parents are like, no, 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 no. Don't ask that question. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, rude. Yeah. that's rude. And I'm sure you, I mean, you've experienced it. I experienced it where, I live in a predominantly white community and mm. little kids will stare because they don't get to see brown people that often, which is totally fine. 
It doesn't mm. bother me. But the parents are horrified and they're like, no, 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 no. And I go, but you're just now adding fear to their lives. And so now yeah. they're not going to be curious. So how do you, like for a parent, for a parent that one either has a child that has a disab disability, how do you get them to like live a life? And for parents that are, your child is going to school with someone, normal, like regular school, and you're going to school with a child that has a disability, how do you sit there like invite them for play dates and get them engaged and have them being part of your, your world without making them feel uncomfortable? Because your mother did something so special where you got to live a life where you are this badass that does, does all these <laughs> random things. So, and, and the kids in your, I mean, and I don't know how the kids it reacted, uh, interacted with you in school, but how does a parent now that just like found out that their child has, you name whatever's, and they're like, okay, how do I, how do I juggle? How do I handle? How do I make them have the best life they possibly can have? They're listening to you right now. What, what, what's the message that you would say? Um, I think it's quite simple, really. For someone who's just had a child with a disability, it's like just treat them how you how you would have a child, really, and having to learn as you go along. I think it's with why well, every human's different anyway. It's just treating them as you would treat yourself. Um, obviously, it's de dependent on what disability that they might have. So. It, you know, a wheelchair user is different to someone who is visually impaired or someone who is deaf. But it's just having to adapt to that situation and uh, love them, basically. That's that's it, really. But when it comes to... And then it's on the art or for people who are not engage with people with disabilities. As I've just mentioned, it's just seeing them as yourself, just... Uh, being a unique like yourself really because everyone's unique everyone's different um and we should talk to each other to learn from each other oh my god i like you isaac you're awesome <laughs> 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 you're, like, you're like it's pretty simple jody i'm like you are you're right no but it is it, it so is yeah. and people make things so much more difficult than it has to be but i mm. i just love i i love everything that you're doing i love that um you're just like even tilts you're just like you go with the flow yeah 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 i mean it's not like i said it's not always been like that i mean every year i would have the new year's resolution oh, i'm gonna do that this year but i mean now that i don't have goals i i, I feel i've achieved a lot more really because i'm i'm have I have my eyes open more to more opportunities now that i'm not focus even though i'm not saying that not being focused is not good it is good to be focused but i don't know, I just like to keep my options open and see what the world has to offer wait i want to reiterate on that so you don't have you don't have goals yeah wait so someone would sit, someone would just say but if you have if you have the goals what are you working towards but you're saying because you don't have the goals things keep popping up yeah i mean for example so in 2021, I, I joined LinkedIn because um, for many years, people was like, oh, you need to join LinkedIn, you need to join LinkedIn. And I thought, oh, why do I need to join the professional Facebook for? Because that's how it was always advertised to me as the professional Facebook. And I thought, OK, I'll, I'll go on and I'm going to share what we're doing with um, wheels and wheelchairs. So maybe we can get sponsors or people interested from the professional world. And that turned into um, me becoming more of a disability advocate and being able to connect with people, like-minded individuals. But, I mean, it's, it's given me opportunities such as, uh, I don't know if you've seen, you know, I modelled for London Fashion Week um, wearing adaptive you're, well, clothing. You're, you're oh, you're modelling now too? Really? Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. All right. No, no, I didn't <laughs> yeah. see that, but now I'm going to look up for that, okay? All right. Yeah. <laughs> so um like that wasn't in my bucket list or even a goal of mine but I mean if I was for example if I was just focused on the wheels and wheelchairs even though I do want to see success in that and like I said I do want to see it done globally um I just don't think I would have done things like that or being able to connect with people and you know get to speak with you and yeah you know there's so many different things that I don't think would have done if I just went down the one path 
well, like you said earlier, but like if I just did video editing and technology, like there, there, there wouldn't be me doing all these outdoor things. So yeah, I just keep my options open. All right. Well, how was the modeling? Yeah, it's cool. I'm doing it again next month, actually. Well, look at, really? I go, so yeah. wait, who are you doing it for? So there's a organization called Unhidden, um, mm -hmm. led by a woman called Victoria, and it's uh, showcasing adaptive clothing for people with disabilities. What do your siblings think? What does your mom think? Like, <laughs> they say, like, I mean, like, now they're just like, I go, what the hell is this? Like, what is Isaac up to now? Like, what, what do they think of all the things that are happening in your life right now? Uh, I think sometimes they think I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they don't know what's going to happen next. Um, but yeah. <laughs> You know what? It's not just you. I mean, my family and friends do the same thing. They're like, oh, what is she up to next? I mean, I've done the whole entire yoga with goats. I've done the parachute. Oh, nice. Like, 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 I mean, I've done, like, I mean, like, I'll see things or hear things. I randomly just get in my car and just, like, just drive. I, yeah. And I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, we live one life. And in mm -hmm. the one life that we live, you might as well just enjoy yourself. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make the most of it. What's the one thing that you gained during the pandemic that you would have never, ever thought about. Like, I mean, you're adventurous, you do things, you you are an advocate, which we're going to talk about that in a, in a few seconds. But I mean, okay. what, what did you gain that you would have never thought would have come into your life if it wasn't for the pandemic? Um, joining LinkedIn, I think. I don't think I would have done that. Because like I said, for years, people would say to do it. But I, I thought since I have more time now, I... I might as well use it. I might as well use another platform to get the wheels and wheelchairs message out there. Um, and yeah, I've gained a lot of friends and connections from there um, because I've been on other social media platforms for way longer. And LinkedIn's been the most engaging platform that I've been on and made some real genuine connections, which has allowed me to do really cool things. Nice. Advocacy. Did you ever think that you'd have that title of being an advocate? Uh, no, I didn't actually. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll tell you how that kind of came about. But um, so before LinkedIn and before twenty uh eighteen. So when I was doing the vlogs on YouTube, I would just film videos and uh to show what I was doing, but I never really spoke about disability because, you know, I, the way I saw it was I just want to film me and show people what I'm doing. I didn't want to show disability. And those of my friends and family, oh, why, why don't you, you know, talk about disability? Like you could really show people, I mean, really educate people and uh, inspire people. And I thought, oh, no, I don't really want to do that. I, I, you know, I just want to create fun videos. So I kept on doing that. And then I was asked to do a talk um up north um talking about overcoming obstacles so i spoke and thought nothing of it really and then a woman came up to me afterwards um who i'd never met before and she said wow well, i've you know i've never i've i i have pains in my legs but i you know and i'm always complaining but i look at you and I don't see why I should be complaining. Um, and I'm going to get on with life. And um, that was the first time I heard something like that from an outside person. Um, I had heard it like in passing and things, but this was the first time I'd like heard that. And it kind of really hit me. Um, and I thought, oh, okay, maybe talk about disability is a good thing and it does have that impact so i started implementing in my videos and those people got educated from that and then yeah then i started doing more public talks about disability went to offices uh schools um and things like that and then then linkedin came along and i became more of an advocate really uh showcasing good and bad stories of having a disability and um yeah i'm considered an advocate so 
technically I've always been living it though, like living with a disability is it I think ultimately as an advocate from day one, but actively um I feel past two well past five years, mainly the past year has been most more of my advocacy though. I I mean where do I go from here? Like I mean <laughs> on, on, I mean I don't even know like even what I can do to I mean like like what am I gonna do to then have like a day that's gonna beat Isaac? What am I gonna do? I mean, you, I mean, for everyone that's listening to you right now, um, if they can just take a little bit of something from you, I think that would be amazing because the world, uh, I shouldn't say the world, so many people are angry. Mm. So many people are frustrated. So many people don't know where to turn. Like, what do I do next? A lot of people are leaving their jobs, but yet they're like, they're, they're unfulfilled. And you are like, constantly that you're you are allowing all these amazing opportunities to just come your way and the simple thing that i love that you're like i set no goal and yet all these opportunities came your way which opened up it it really opened up so much more for you and i i just this is just amazing absolutely 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 i mean this is not this is not the last time we will talk but this is a great this is a great introduction for people to understand that badasses like you exist in this world that are changing the world for the better and yet mm-hmm. not enough people are know about you and so the more people you talk to the more platforms that you're on the more that people can understand why you are who you are the better i mean i thank you. round of thank applause you. to you isaac thank you thank, I mean, thank you so very much for taking a moment out of your time what time is it there right now uh, it's free in the afternoon okay it's 10 o'clock in the morning here so, right. so, so I really, I mean, I do appreciate so much for you taking your time um, out of your busy life, not even your busy <laughs> yeah. day, but your busy life just yeah. to talk to me and share your story, which is great. Um, and I always say that um, the more people hear sto- other people's stories, the more that people hear ways that you challenge yourselves, they just need to take a little nugget of what you said. It, and this is like now adopting into their lives. So thank you very much for being the president of an organization that opens up the door to so many individuals to be creative, enjoy each other. Mm. Um, when you're having a good day, bad day, you know you have a group of individuals that you can like just get out there and and just just be on wheels, just be out there and be on wheels. But also just the the modeling and the LinkedIn and just really everything that you're touching, um, the self taught, surrounding yourself with great people, um, educating yourself, and knowing that school isn't great for me, but you're always learning. You're always yes, learning yeah. and you're and you found ways to teach yourself to be better without being in a traditional school. So I mean, I'm everything you said, I mean, just like it's sticky. Like I'm you're it's sticky. It's all over. All over. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. But but I I but this is where we do end for today. But I, I always say I end, I start with understanding who you are as a person before we hear about the the services, the business, the organization, and we end by hearing your needs. So um, if you had a personal ask or a in, not or, and a professional ask, what would it be? So two answers. What would be your personal ask and what would be your professional ask to anyone that is listening to you right now? Um, Personal, sorry, ask, you said personal ask. Yeah, okay. Um, Let me start with professional. Um. <laughs> I think a professional ask is if you would like to follow what we're doing online. Um, it's at Wheels and Wheelchairs, which is on all platforms. Um, because of my busy life, I need to get back onto the Instagram and post on there more often. Um, luckily, our Facebook page and our website's updated more, which is good to showcase what we're doing. And if you would like to start your own groups anywhere in the world um give us a message and we'll let us we'll let you know what equipment we use um and how you can set up your own groups because we would love to see it done worldwide and i think personal ask is to carry on being happy and being your all unique selves um because that's what's going to keep the world turning. 
Um, I I love them both. Um, I love <laughs> both. No, I do. I love them both. But yeah. you know what I have to say? I'm going. To, so I'm going to introduce you to um, Brian Schwartz. So Brian Schwartz is um, a wonderful person that I've had on the podcast um, right. twice. I, I had him like a year. Like I like it was a year and a half after. So I had him at the very very beginning. I had him a year and a half. Uh, he um, worked in he, he works in marketing, yeah. but during the pandemic he got laid off. And um, he started mowing lawns. He remembered when he was younger, he would just mow lawns to make money. And so he didn't have a job. And his dad was his dad was ill. His wife just had a baby. His grandfather just died. It was a really tough time. And we were in a pandemic. So he just basically started volunteering and mowing lawns for people. And it's become a sensation where he has volunteers all over the country now. And I think that okay. the two of you guys would be a great. It'd be a great conversation because you want to grow this. He's a great person because he grew it, and it's just like people just want to do good things. Mm. So, yeah, I'll make a, um, so I'll make an introduction during. I'll make an introduction via email because like that's one of the things that I love about the podcast. I like you guys would have never met. I mean, you're in the UK. He's in um, New Jersey. Nice. Put you guys together and just have a good conversation. Yeah, that's what it's about connecting people together mm. um, for the better of everyone. So thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> you're so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great laugh great sense of humor i'm like you know, yeah. wait wait i got a question what are you gonna do next what's the next big thing that so like i feel like you've done a lot of stuff but what's the next big thing that you want to do i guess we'll have to wait and find out <gasps> oh, <laughs> oh <it's> so intriguing <laughs> Well, it's so, like so I do have coming up is um, I'm working with the local council and surrounding disability organizations mm -hmm. to do a disability festival. Okay. Um, which has been so much work, but that's in two weeks time, which should be good. Um, I don't know wh when this is coming out, but um, we do have a fundraising link for that so we okay. can make it very inclusive. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's um, good. But for me, yeah, we'll have to wait and find out what the big thing is next. I can't wait. I just can't wait. I mean, so can I. <laughs> well, you know what? Because because you so you you said you don't have any goals. I have three like three um, funnels. So I have my to do list. I have yeah. my bucket list. What well, four? I my to do list, my yeah. bucket list, my OMG list, and my holy shiz that will never happen list. And so oh, that's interesting. Uh, my, ma, we're A types. You got to sit there and push the envelope. So I'll <laughs> I'll just I'll just because like I like I like to just put out the holy shit is that so I, it used to be holy shit that will never happen but one of my clients got really upset because she's, like, <laughs> you know, she's like so i call it holy shit that will never happen list on the right. holy shiz, i only have five things on the list number one five marathons five days like, i'm sorry seven marathons seven days seven continents okay it's a real thing um yeah, yeah, i want to yeah. go to the vatican and get a private tour from the pope of the catacombs um yeah. I want to massage a human heart to keep someone alive. Okay. Um, I want to um be at the White House, having my meal, and during dessert, the, the during my dessert, the, the president says, "Jody, you look tired. Why don't you sleep over?" And then, <laughs> yeah. And the last one, um, I want to be able. I have no major talents, but I want to have. I want to be an egot. So I want to get an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony, knowing that I don't have a known talent. You know what? Everything's possible. If one of those things comes true, I'm 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 good. I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, that's cool. Yeah, I've been See? near the Pope. I've been near the Pope though. You what? I haven't met the Pope, but I've been near him. Wait, he, where were you near him? <laughs> he drove past me. Um, in uh Poland. Okay, so see, I need no. I need the whole entire meeting <laughs> enjoyment. I want to make you laugh. I want to. Yeah, at least I want to ask the Pope. Can I get the private tour? I may get a no. May I might? Yeah. Everyone's like, you're going to get a no. I'm like, I may get a no, but I may get a yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You it's never different. know. What am I going to do? It's not like I'm going to steal things down there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they will make sure you don't. <laughs> <laughs> that and also, I I do feel that because popes are now retiring. Like back in the day, you don't retire. You have the job to your death. They're retiring. So I think that the rules are changing. So I think I got a hmm. chance. No, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll speak to my contacts and see what I could do. Though. Okay. <laughs> 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 I 
Isaac, thank you so very much, my friend. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Um, I will send it. Look, um, before the end of the day, I'll sit there and send an email to in introduce you to Brian. Oh, perfect. Thank and you. Even, and even and, and 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 just in case I forget, Brian will hear this podcast and he'll be like, "Hey, wait, did you introduce us?" I'm like, "Nope, I didn't." So I'm even saying you're here <laughs> to make the introduction to Brian. Brian Schwartz, yep. New Jersey, mow mow my lawn. Yep, perfect. Okay. I look forward to uh, more conversations <laughs> like this. Okay. All right. Thank you, Isaac. Have a wonderful day and have a wonderful weekend. Yes, you too. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.